Okay, we're back here at the Kennedy Space Center where uh, nothing much is happening because it all happened some 47, 48 minutes or so ago when Columbia lifted off and is now on its way uh, in orbit and proceeding very satisfactorily. Gene Cernan is here with me, and Gene, I uh, noticed we just received a report on the heartbeats, and it's kind of interesting. Angles uh, 110 up to 120 at launch, and uh, Dick Truly's 86 up to 94. Well, that reflects a couple things, I believe, their enthusiasm, and also uh, uh, the responsibility of the commander. He's got to make some decisions as to whether or not they may have to abort, and it's his decision, his decision alone, if, uh, if there's no other time to discuss it with anybody else. He does have the added responsibility, sure, yeah. But there's a guy important. flown into space in the, in the uh, X-15 16 times, and he still responds, so it's always a first time. It's never routine. He's the veteran, and yet his heartbeat went up uh, a little more rapidly and more steeply than did... Uh, Truly, but you could hardly call Truly a rookie, though. Well, yeah. In terms of space flight, of course, they both are, aren't they, really? Of actual orbital flight. Yeah. This, the heartbeat, I've always felt, doesn't necessarily uh, indicate apprehension either. It's, it's enthusiasm. It's, 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 it's they're ready for this, and they're there, and it's an exciting thing like a young kid going on the uh, merry-go-round for what the first was time. The, uh, what was the difference between uh, yours on your first launch and the uh, next time you went up? Do you recall? I think they were as high as they could possibly go each time. Uh, again, each time was always the first time for me. Uh, the first time I ever flew, uh, I think they could have strapped me and blindfolded. I would have gone. I was a little bit more aware of what was happening the second and third time. But uh, that heart rate responds to what's going on. And uh, I don't recall exactly, but I know it was in the area that Joe's, probably 110, 115. Well, they've got quite a bit to do today, uh, and they still have a long day of activity ahead of them. Actually, about, uh, oh... Let's see, it's about 35 minutes or so. We should uh, be getting, getting the first uh, television from the spacecraft when they will show us uh, what is not necessarily the most exciting television, perhaps, but it will be the opening of the uh, payload bay, <coughs> which is uh, vital to uh, the success of this mission because uh, get the payload bay open, then, of course, they will uh, be able to extend the arm of course, they got to keep the doors open most of the time during the mission anyway, don't they, Chief? Well, there's some coolant and thermal requirements on keeping the doors open. Of course, the main mission of the, of the shuttle, when it, once it becomes operationally, is through the use of that payload bay, and those doors must open and close with a great deal of, of routineness, a great deal of confidence. Of course, that's where the, uh, this, uh, the, the arm, the, the uh, manipulator arm, is located uh, uh, that we've talked so much about. All right, for those of you who have just joined us, we'd like to reset the scene once again as, as best we can. We are little more than 50 minutes into the second mission of Columbia, the space shuttle. And here you see it over the Indian Ocean, uh, moving along down toward uh, Australia. They're probably just coming into their own nighttime, the nighttime that into we will their... see for maybe another eight or ten hours. Mm -hmm. The sun is setting. Uh, they don't have the advantage of seeing the, the beauty of that sunset because it's, yes. it's, it's behind them. Uh, and they're going forward, but they will see the beauty of the sunrise. Okay. Let's replay now, for those of you who uh, may have missed it, the, uh, the launch of uh, Columbia 50 minutes ago. From the other direction. Different spot. No, there it goes. There it goes. There go the liquid engines on the shuttle, and then here will come. There's the solid boosters. You can hear the crowd. That launch is a great equalizer for, 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 for commoners and kings alike. Oh, sure. Gene and Frank? Yes, Jules, go ahead. It was a spectacular view from here. Uh, you know, we actually could see the solids ignite and the liquid, uh, and liquids ignite and the solids then ignite. You could? Uh, oh, sure. Uh, we're forward most uh, camera position here, and we're as the, the uh, press site is blocked out by the RSS, the rotating service structure. We are not. Here's now, another. Now, uh, here we're going to see it replayed again. Yeah, sure. This is for a camera uh, atop our ABC camera position here. Go, come on. Jules, that's a little bit better picture than uh, we had when I was out there with you because the wind blew some of the smoke away. Gene, you know, I've, se I've seen and covered and co-anchored every one of these manned flights, and my heart was really with them this morning. It was spectacularly clear, and of course, it didn't matter whether you know Joe Engel closely the way I do, or Dick Truly just a little bit the way I do. Uh, they were our guys, and they were going up to do it, and it was a very emotional moment. Jules, uh, 
you know, we all know uh, it makes a difference whether there's people on top, uh, uh, whether it's a piece of hardware, whether it's got life in it, on it, life is part of it makes a big difference. Well, another part that made it most interesting, Gene, was Joe Engel's unflagging modesty and sense of humor. When they landed back here the other day, he kidded with our photographer saying, you better get it right this time, this is the last chance you're going to have. Jules, that plume of smoke we see from the uh, solid rocket boosters uh, is over 700 feet long, and uh, uh, that's uh, perhaps five times higher than the booster itself. The acid mist cloud, if you, if you want to call it that, blew right over our camera site, Gene, so that's one thing you missed by being inside with Frank. You've missed being... Well, I wonder... Uh... Gee, what a shot. <laughs> we'll see probably very shortly the uh, solid rockets shut down. And, and it, it is very critical uh, that they both depart, yes. separate and depart at the same time. It almost, it almost looked like an animation, you know. The first uh, television from the uh, spacecraft will occur in about uh, 30 minutes or so when they will open the payload uh, doors. And uh, that will be very important, of course, because uh, on this mission, they are going to demonstrate uh, the capability of the arm, the Canada arm that is uh, made by the uh, Canadians and uh, is on board this time. That's, of course, a very integral part of the uh, space shuttle because eventually the shuttle is to be sort of a delivery truck to take things up and, if necessary, bring them down. And the arm will be used uh, quite extensively on that. But, however, one of the interesting things about the opening of the payload uh, bay doors or the cargo bay doors is that when that happened on the first launch last April, uh, that's when we first discovered that uh, there had been some loss of tiles. Remember, there was quite a bit of concern about that, Gene, about whether the tiles would actually survive and uh, stay intact so that uh, they would be able to complete the mission and land all right. Well, I think that's one of the things we're going to be looking for very closely uh, on this mission again is to see whether we uh, were able to find where those tiles are critical and uh, find out uh, if we've solved the problems with losing those first few tiles. There's going to be other problems like that as we go along with the program until we build up a, a system, a spacecraft, where those things that may have some failure patterns in them early will truly last for 40, 50 flights into the future. Well, the payload bay doors must, of course, uh, open, and uh, they must be able to close them, too, uh, in order to bring them down. And uh, Steve Shepard has prepared this report on the importance and the process of the uh, doors in the cargo bay. Steve? The cargo bay doors down the back of the orbiter Columbia are a surprisingly complex and critical part of the shuttle spacecraft. They aren't the kind of doors you find on the side of a boxcar. For one thing, they are very large. Each of the doors is 60 feet long and 6.7 feet wide and weighs as much as two compact cars. They are made not of titanium or some other exotic metal, but of a graphite epoxy material, a sort of sophisticated plastic which is both lighter and stronger than metal. Attached to the inner side of the doors are four giant radiators. When the shuttle reaches orbit, the doors are open to expose these radiators and allow them to vent off heat into space. So much heat builds up inside during launch and from the electronics on board that the doors must be opened and the radiators exposed or the shuttle must be brought down by its fifth orbit. Conversely, the shuttle cannot land unless the doors are closed. The doors are operated by an automatic system commanded by the spacecraft's computers. But should the automatic system fail, they can be opened and closed by hand. The astronauts train for this contingency underwater, which simulates a weightless state. In space, an astronaut would have to don a spacesuit and enter the unpressurized cargo bay. At the bay's aft wall, he would attach a kind of large socket wrench to an exposed fitting and crank the doors open or shut using muscle power. If it were necessary, the astronaut could also inspect the doors, either by traversing the inside of the cargo bay or by moving along the outside surfaces of the doors, which are equipped with handholds. In principle, doors would not seem an especially sophisticated part of any spacecraft. On the shuttle, they are. Yes, the simple opening and closing of a door becomes a very, very important uh, function. We are about uh, half an hour away now from actually opening the door on board Columbia. And for more on that now, we want to go to the Johnson Space Center in Houston and Steve Bell. Steve? Frank, uh, the astronauts play an active role in this uh, activating of the cargo bay door. In fact, they're getting out of their seats for the first time on this flight now that they are in their uh, orbit for a five-day mission. And uh, Joe Allen is sitting here with uh, 
the knowledge of someone who's firsthand gone through all this in the simulator. How difficult is it to get unstrapped, get out? What are they doing exactly? Uh, Steve, there's a, a very real difference between simulator and what uh, Joe and Dick are going through now, though, because gravity's been turned off. Right. And so for the first time, the, for any length of time, the two of them are now weightless. And uh, one senses that as the straps are taken off. You unbuckle your, your seat belt, so to speak, and suddenly you're not in the, the seats anymore, but floating. And so right now they, for the first time, are floating out of the seats, and they will float to the back of the flight deck, and it's from that point that uh, they will open the doors. They look back out through windows, the same view that we'll get using their television cameras, and uh, open the door from that vantage point.